Welcome to Save It for the Blind podcast. I'm here with Jake Messerly, CWA's Chief Operating Officer, and Chad Santier, our Wetlands Program Supervisor and NACA Coordinator. Thanks for coming on, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Why don't you kind of give us a little background of your uh, why you're with CWA, how long you've been, where you came from, all that good stuff. Um, well, I started out with CWA back in the spring of 99, been here just a little over 24 years. Um, started out, went to college in Sacramento State, um, undergrad and graduate degree from there. During college, I worked for the Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Forest Service, private consulting firm, and um, pretty much got into duck hunting during my high school years. Learning okay. how to, worked at a fly shop in the Bay Area, and the landowner had a property out in the grasslands and went duck hunting with him one time and that was it i was hooked were you one of the first employees at cwa to start kind of doing actual habitat work moving dirt etc writing grants um i believe i was the second or the third as far as dirt movers go okay uh, rob capriola at the time hired me and i was hired to implement a NACA grant north american wetland conservation act grant and that pretty much started um my role as far as developing proposals, getting projects funded, implementing them on the ground, and uh, that pretty much expanded from there throughout the state, um, taking advantage of NACA and getting funding for California waterfowl that allowed us to expand our personnel and the m- number of biologists that were implementing projects. Yeah, but you work throughout the whole state, and then kind of the Butte Sink is kind of your bread and butter as well? Yep, yeah, started in the Sacramento Valley and um, expanded southward. Currently, I deal with the Sacramento Valley along with Scott Capra, and then uh, deal with Southern California and Eastern Sierra, south of Tahoe, and implement projects in those regions. And then we do have Greg Heideman up in Northeastern California. Yeah. Scott Capra is helping me in the Sacramento Valley. And then Preston Brunk is down in the grasslands. And we have Paul Phillips that deals with the Yolo Bypass Delta. And Robert Eddings is dealing with Sassoon Marshall, along with a, a host of other staff that we have over in Sassoon dealing with properties yeah, and projects. Yeah, a lot and going on over there. A lot going on in Sassoon. Absolutely. Zach Stratton and... Rich, Rich Kane. Kane. Yeah, no, we've got a good good team. I would agree. Good group of folks. Yeah. How are you, Mr. Mesterly? Me? Um, well, I uh, I was chasing flashlights down a gravel road at Los Banos Wildlife Area, um, I don't know, 36 some years ago. My dad threw me over his shoulder and drug me out into a, a tule patch. And uh, I remember sitting there watching watching the sunrise and you know, listening to the dogs splash around in the water and the decoys hitting and uh, all the birds, you know, all the noises that they make in the morning and the, the marsh just coming alive. And, you know, as a kid, that was quite the experience. And it, it stuck with me. And, you know, I didn't want to do anything else ever since. You know, I we were sitting in the sweat line every Friday, every Tuesday, um, getting out of school, hunting, you know, the public areas every weekend. Um and if if we weren't chasing ducks, we were you know fishing or whatever else. So I mean, I I grew up outside and and uh, um, you know just have a passion for it. And um, long story short, I you know followed that passion. Um, went to UC Davis, work with uh, you know John Eady, uh, world renowned waterfowl professor and uh, great mentor and. Um, Lucky enough to fall into a job at CWA. Um, you know, I was talking hunting and fishing with a fish and game guy, and and uh, out of the blue, I got a phone call. And he had recommended that I, you know, interview for a job at CWA. And Dave Patterson at the time, mm-hmm. good old Dave. Um, he asked me. I remember in the interview, he asked me, "Hey, did you ever drive a tractor?" I'm like, well, "Yeah, I worked in construction. I drove a tractor." And, I told him I couldn't take the job because I was still in school, but he wanted to interview me anyway. And I came and sat down with him and talked. And he said, you drive a tractor? I said, yeah, I drive a tractor. All right, you're hired. All right. I'm like, what? What do you mean I'm hired, you know? And he wouldn't let me say no. So I've been here for 22-plus years and loved every minute of it. Wow, that's crazy. You know, it's funny how things work out, you know? Yeah. 
Has your guys' passion wavered for waterfowl hunting, or has it gotten deeper as uh, time's gone on? I know mine's changed, but it's still definitely strong, but um, changed in different ways. Yeah, definitely over time, I, I, I have a better respect for it. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a time of year where you're out of the field and you have time to reflect on what you've got accomplished all summer. And you're able to go out and, and do some waterfowl hunting and, and visit with people that you maybe didn't get to see all summer. And finally, you're all doing the same thing again. And Yeah. I mean, waterfowl hunting is always, you know, if I'm not out there Wednesday or Saturday, I'm kind of missing, I'm like, you stress out about it, <laughs> you know. Um, but definitely being able to, to hunt in areas where you've done work and seen, you know, a big part of my life is managing a marsh and, and seeing the yearly changes that take place and all the effort that you put into your management to see the fruits of those labor and of that labor and then you see the waterfowl usage of that habitat i mean that's really for me where it's at i, oh, I love yeah. i love managing a marsh i love seeing the results seeing how the birds and all the wildlife that depend upon wetlands react to it and that's kind of like that's that passion that dave patterson always talked about like Dave was a big passion guy. He's like, I only hire guys that have passion for what we do because then I know they're going to work hard. And you're like, it's true. I mean, you have people that yeah. come into a position, and if they don't have the passion, it seems like you just don't get as much out of them sometimes. Oh, yeah, I agree. It's, I mean, and duck hunters are kind of crazy people where yeah. we have a sickness, an illness that yeah. – that's where you get that extra effort out of guys is like you know, if they duck hunt you know you know guys gals abuse, whatever not that we abuse our staff and get everything you know, get everything sometimes. out of them you can but <laughs> yeah but definitely i no, mean no that's comment there. yeah the, you know that's where for me it's like it falls here you kind of let your foot off the the gas pedal a little bit and enjoy what you've done all summer and yeah it's every year it's the same thing it's a cycle but at the same time it's like going into fall and winter it's like okay now i can rejuvenate <laughs> get office work done but get some hunting in and that's what keeps you hungry for it man i need to switch departments getting your guys a department <laughs> we're full buddy <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you get to manage the duck club up there you're good so when we talk about wetlands and california waterfowl what is our role in that i mean the money that's coming through these grants is that Hunting licenses, duck stamps, is that potential water bond? Where is all of this money coming from? It sounds like there's a bunch of different programs, um, and depending on the landowner and the property, it might be a better fit for one program or the next. And how does that, you know, if I'm a landowner and I approach you guys, is CWA money going into these projects, these private duck clubs or these private clubs, or is it, are we kind of acting as a, you know, project manager and grabbing the funding from, you know, a duck stamp and then the landowner is, you know, doing 50%. How does that really work? And we get it a lot where basically, you know, CWA or, or other organizations are helping wealthy people supplement their privately owned property, right? So kind of putting that to bed of, of what CWA does and how we do it, you know, are membership dollars going to, you know, private individuals and to help their properties yeah yeah Want to take that? Yeah. generally no i mean membership dollars are paying for our time when it's not paid for by a grant so can't say absolutely no that no membership resources are going into benefiting private land um one thing to note is that 60 percent of the managed wetlands in california are on privately land on, on private land so if you want to make sure that you know, we have healthy waterfowl populations. We can't ignore private land, um, plain and simple. As far as the funding goes, um, there's so many different sources, pots of funds. Um, we traditionally tap into just a few. Um, federal, the North American Wetlands Conservation Act program, it's a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Department of Interior um, program. Um, that's Chad's bread and butter. He's, he's done more work in the country, I think, you know, dollar-wise, acres-wise than anybody as an individual. Um, actually got an award. Was it the Cinnamon Teal Spoonie Award or something? Yeah. Spoonie Award. Yeah. <laughs> Congrats. Um, Spoonie Teal Award. Yeah. But, uh, and then that, like, in a, any given year with the amount of money that we're putting on the ground, whether it's 5 to $7 million typically, uh, like just last year, 72% of the funds that we brought in went on public ground. So with private landowner projects, they're – 
always contributing to their project. Mm -hmm. So when, like he was saying, like Jake was saying with the NACA, North American Wetlands Conservation Act, it's an act that was passed by Congress back in 89, and it's allocated funds annually as part of the um, federal appropriations process. And that's been our biggest grant supplier of funds to improve wetlands within the state of California. And we work within those grant proposals, you package together a host of projects, anywhere from 10 to 20 projects, sometimes a few more, but um, say between 10 and 20 projects, and it's always a mix of private and public projects because it's competitive, you're ranked, you're scored. Basically, they talk, start from the top score and start funding all the way down until they're out of money for it. And they have two application times each year. But to get the best score, you need to package together private and federal and state projects. So you have a, a host of projects that are benefiting a large acreage that are that's producing great benefits for migratory as well as resident birds. And with cost share. With non, and with non cost, share. cost share. That's the big component of those federal grants is you have to have a matching component. So all the pri generally all the private land projects that we do, they're putting up at least 50% of the cost of that project. That's the landowner putting that's in the landowner, their, their own, own money. money. Time money, yeah. Exactly. Money up. generally. Yeah. And the yeah. development of those grants is all on CWA's dime. So the grant doesn't pay CWA to develop projects, to package together the proposals, to submit them, which in reality can take CWA anywhere from two to 400 hours of personnel time to develop those. You mm -hmm. have to meet with landowners, need to meet with agency personnel, develop <laughs> the project, yeah. go back and write the proposal and then submit it. And so anywhere in there, that's a cost to CWA because then- That's membership money. That's membership yeah. money, which is providing CWA compensation for developing this grant, which then brings in the millions of dollars to do work both on private and public. On these proposals, is there higher points for providing public access? Is that a component yeah. of it? Yes. So there is technical question seven, which does have a caveat in there is like, how much of the proposal is going to be publicly hunted, how much of it's going to be is not available to the public for access. So that's in there, written in there, as far as NACA goes. Now, the state has various funding programs, which we work closely with, especially with the Wildlife Conservation Board. There's also California Duck Stamp funding. Mm -hmm. The majority of California Duck Stamp funds is always being put on public ground. Yeah, okay. Very, um, I, 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 I'm, I can't even think of a time where that yeah. money was on on private ground, except way back when, I believe that there was a brood pond program where uh, yep. the state duck stamp funds were paying for you know brood habitat. Uh, but that's a really that's a limited pot of funds. Uh, in the grand scheme of things. When we talk about this, these monies, it's going in the ground, right? Moving dirt structures, things like that. It's not necessarily paying for water or actually the management costs of these wetlands. That could be pretty high, you know, depending on where you're at. Generally, yeah. I mean, most of the project work that we do is one-time capital improvements. There, in the last few years, th there has been a greater focus on identifying, you know, annual management funds. Um, you know, I think it's there's a huge need for that. Um, managing wetlands are expensive. Yeah, you look at the very. the cost to pump. You know, mosquito abatement fees, um, and when you get into places that traditionally had a lot of ducks that no longer do. Yeah. Um, the incentive to manage those is not there. So, you know, at least no ducks during the, you know, the hunting season, right? Yeah. So thinking somewhere like the Tulare Basin. Kern County, yeah. It's Kern hard. County, right? Um, we've got like 25,000 acres of wetlands down there left, I think. And, um, you know, those landowners are spending a lot of money to manage wetlands to get a relatively few number of ducks, especially yeah. compared to what they used to. So, um, you know, the various partners, um, agencies have recognized that we've got to do everything that we can to support, you know, wetland managers to make sure that we can, for all the other benefits that wetlands provide, make sure that that, the, you know, that land remains wet and, um, and that annual management cost is a big one. So, you know, the state's got the Presley program where they'll pay wetland managers, you know, a certain amount every year. Um, and then, you know, we've got other, other small pots of funds that have been popping up through these these various, you know, efforts to, to help folks. Um, and I, I think that's going to continue to be a, a, a problem in California as the interest in hunting wanes if, if you know, the ability to shoot a duck yeah. is further impacted. Who's going to pay for putting water on the ground? 
Um, that's it's tough. Very expensive, and, and I don't a, think people realize that. A lot of the program, especially NACA, is, was established in a way where the agencies seem to provide pro opportunities to do these infusions of money into private landowners. Since the majority of the, you know, the remaining wetlands of California are privately owned, the agencies do see the value in the fact that as a landowner, you're, you're, you're annually paying for the upkeep management yeah. of those lands. They couldn't possibly afford to own all the remaining wetlands within the state of California yeah. and provide those opportunities to people. Um, so as a private landowner, they, they see the value in the fact that if they can do infusions of funds every you know decade or couple decades for a landowner where they make sure that those privately owned wetlands are very efficient, that they're manageable, that those people have some resources available to, to them to do capital improvements so that those wetlands will remain functional. Yeah. Those programs are really set up to do those improvements on those properties. And then having CWA involved, it really allows landowners, you know, even the agency personnel where, you know, you might own a wetland and you might do a project every 15 to 30 years maybe, right? Well, you might have been the guy in charge of it 25 years ago, but now somebody new and it's like building a house. Not everybody builds a house every day, but CWA biologists, I mean, we're building duck clubs and federal and state refuge areas every day during the construction season. And so there's not a whole lot that we haven't seen before how to fi figure out workarounds are the most efficient way to do things. Even though we have great contractors that are doing all the major implementation of the, the capital improvements, the design work is where it comes in where we're able to look at projects and figure out the most efficient way to get water on and off of them, <clears throat> how to build in recapturing systems where people can recycle their water and reuse it. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, that's where wetlands are going in the state of California is the fact that we need to make them super water efficient, right? Yeah. And make your capabilities so that when you do purchase that water and you get it on the ground, let's make it where you can reuse it as many times as possible. Um, you know, if flood up for the fall, if you can recapture it and store it and use it for your brood ponds or your spring irrigations, the best of all worlds, because then you're just buying it once and maybe getting to use it two or three times. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, I think a lot of hunters, maybe the public hunter in general, you know, their biggest complaint is, you know, the habitat on public ground is in decline. Um, but that's hard to your point. You've got to be able to reuse the water without water and irrigation. It's really hard to grow duck food. And then the other side of it is the funding. So if they have a budget for a state refuge it's very expensive to flood mosquito abatement right. costs spraying etc so i would say some of these managers hands are tied in terms of what they could produce on a year-to-year -year basis but what are you guys seeing on terms of like management side and how that's changed with potential managers that come from you know a non-hunting background and just kind of how that's changed since you guys have been here for over 20 years man if you can if you can get a, a a state or federal wildlife area manager that that hunts keep them uh, it's, i mean stuff gets done when you have a passion for what you do no yeah. doubt um all the other things that you said are true budgets personnel state federal bureaucracies they all complicate a manager's ability to get things done i think that's why chad and i generally that's why we work for cwa and not you know the government i i don't know that yeah. i could I don't know that I could survive in a in that environment, um, but I, you know I do I do feel for you know our 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 public um, managers managers. I mean they've they've got a tough job in in you know all the things that they have to deal with and the different interests. You know again yeah. those wildlife areas are not just for ducks. Um, Absolutely, we may like to think that they are, but you know think of a place like Yola Wildlife Area. Um, there's all kinds of different interests looking at that place. Um, you know, from, you know, bats to fish to whatever, you know? Um, yeah. And hunters tend to get a narrow mind of, you know, it's a right. hunting refuge. It's, it's just for the hunter, but in the scope yeah. of things, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot more than, than just a hunting place to hunt. Yeah. Which yeah. And, fun. and, and we, we also as hunters like to, you know, rightfully so talk about how much money we contribute to these systems. Right. Um, and that's important. And I don't want to, you know, marginalize that but you look at california how many people there are and all the money that throw, flows through these different bond acts and budgets um you know the the million to two million bucks that we raise in duck stamps at the state is nothing when you yeah. start looking at the the budgets of these wildlife areas right. and where those funds come from 
yes, we've got Pittman Robertson Act funds and you know all those things come together to, to make the system work. But with the swipe of a pen, you know, the state of California is dedicating hundreds of millions of dollars to various programs. So there's there's a lot of money out there for a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, and as those political winds shift and those interests shift, mm. right? Um, there's a lot of money out there besides what hunters contribute, and I think we got to keep that in into perspective. Um, yeah. That it's uh, what we contribute is important, <clears throat> but we don't own every single thing on these wildlife areas. And yeah, because it's not just hunter dollars going into it, no. but it has seemed like the last few years has Definitely. there's been an influx of it's cash the last like three years have been the most productive as far as within the state looking at the department of fish and wildlife and their funding of their equipment purchases and i mean of the two plus decades i've been around the last three years have been the most exciting that i have seen for the wildlife area staff Mm -hmm. um, the managers and their ability to get equipment currently yeah. and getting new equipment and getting the equipment that they need to do the work that they need to do on the ground. So that's been, you know, whether it's just federal trickle down effect and, and where the money was coming from or how it was allocated. I think it's opportunity in crisis, right? Yeah. You know, and, and he, we've seen it over the years. I mean, the funding goes up and down and it, it typically, you know, COVID, all of a sudden, there's more money than we know what to do with. Yep. You know, drought. All of a sudden, there's more money than we know what to do with. Yeah, and that's been. I mean, there's so there's been so much money over the last ten years that we haven't been able to really take advantage of it. Um, Equipment wise, the, the the wildlife areas are looking significantly better than they yeah. have. Yeah, and so you know, I I work with a lot of different wildlife area managers, and I'm seeing great results from their ability to have equipment that's functioning that. When they go out to use it, it actually works, and they're and they and they're getting implements that they can actually use now that yeah. they've really needed for a long period of time. So, um, you know, Southern California wildlife areas are, are looking better than they have in, in quite some time. Working with their staff, and even in Sacramento Valley, where I do quite a bit of work as well, you know, I'm seeing a lot more in the way of improved management capabilities with the equipment that they're having and taking <coughs> advantage of it. I know. A lot of times the public gets frustrated because we'll hear about it, about things not getting done. But at the same time, it's do they have the budget for it? Do they have the personnel? I yeah. mean, it, anywhere else in any private industry, if you lose an employee, pretty much you can get that employee. It doesn't take you a couple days yeah. to fly the job to maybe a couple weeks to get them hired and get them working. When a state employee is lost, it can take months and months and months to get replacements. Or to even backfill it. They might just say, They yeah. may lose the position. Exactly, so there's yeah. a lot of times where people, the public gets frustrated with the wildlife area because things aren't getting done. But it's like they have a process, and the process yeah. has to be followed. And you may not have a person in that position for 6, 9, 12 months sometimes. And that affects everything because now everybody else has to pull that person's position's weight. So, um yeah, I would say overall, I mean, probably they're understaffed. You talk to most of them, but, you know, I think they do quite a bit with what they have, and you got to give it to, you know, the guys that are working and girls that are working hard at the refuges to make it happen. But, you know, you got to feel for them because um, it's not an easy job, you know, dealing with the public interest and um, their budget constraints and hiring Definitely. and all that. So, yeah, I mean, you know what it takes. You're managing yeah. Sanborn and Butte Creek <coughs> Island Ranch, and yeah. you know you've got a few staff. It's a lot of work, labor to love. But you get it done, though. That's yeah, and I think most of the managers, you know, coming from that ba hunting background, you you want people to have you know a good hunt, or you want to see a lot of ducks or other wildlife using the property. So you kind of go try to go above and beyond, you know, expectations. Yeah. So. <coughs> but. Um, so you know, we talked about funding. There's a lot of stuff coming down the line now of, you know, with the state. You got beaver management plans. We have fish monies that come to the wetlands as well. You know, how has that changed, too, in the terms of how we manage for wetlands and kind of our role as a waterfowl organization with all these other pieces of the puzzle kind of coming back in? I think. Well, yeah, I know it's, it is interesting, you know, especially with the fish stuff, um, you know, the the fish folks are, are catching up with the with the wetland community and the wetland managers. You know, we've always we've always man the duck guys have managed for specific things. Yeah. Like we want to produce X amount of seed or, you know, X amount of acres of brood habitat. And, you know, the fish um, 
fish folks are, are now working in that direction where they're trying to grow or, or uh, you know, produce X amount of food on X amount of acres, um, provide additional rearing habitat and, and flood wetlands for fish. And they've done a good job of advocating for funding and they're creating programs that will, you know, manage for specific targets, just like we've been doing. Yeah. Um, and all of those, you know, there's, there's definitely, there's an overlap between fish habitat and duck habitat. Um, and there are times when that overlap is good and there's times when that uh, creates problems, um, especially for duck hunters. You know, I, yeah. I, Yola Bypass, for example, um, we've got endangered fish in the Delta and our river salmon and smelt. And these programs are designed to single species management. We've got we to fix the fish at, at all costs, right? Well, let's flood the Yola Bypass, you know, throughout the middle of the duck season and cover up all the food in the wetlands that we built for shallow managed wetlands for ducks and duck hunters. We've got some very upset, um, you know, members in the, in the bypass because of some of the things that are, that are happening for fish. And we've seen those types of activities growing and expanding into different areas. The Sutter Bypass, you know, the Butte Sink, um, you know, you look at the Klamath Basin, you know, fish kind of run the world right now because yeah. of the single species management. And, you know, my fear is that, you know, you manage something into extinction and at the same time you're negatively impacting other species while you're doing it. So we're starting to hear more about multi-benefit projects, but in the end, it's all about water for people, and the the endangered fish is Im impeding um, the water agency's ability to move water around. So the focus is is fixing fish um, so that we can move water around, and there are definite impacts to ducks and duck hunters. And yeah. ducks generally, I think, are going to be fine. I mean, they can go to a lot of places. They yeah. don't live in the water. Um, but, you know, things are getting complicated. And there's opportunities there, too, where we can partner with the, the you know, the fish groups. You know, example, we're, we're able to help landowners um, get, get funding for, you know, uh, for flooding up their wetlands at different times of the years, uh, year um, to benefit fish. Well, coincidentally, it benefits ducks. Yeah. So um, there's some trade-offs, but there, there's definitely some opportunities there. When we're talking about fish, primarily salmon, primarily in, salmon. In, in the Butte yeah. Sink area and all that, um, that's all coming in. I mean, Sanborn Slough had the, I think the largest salmon smolt um, in one of their studies, which was pretty cool to see. Um, to yeah, I mean, between providing us a, a place for young salmon to come migrate through the system and then, you know, feed on those floodplains. Yeah. Um, yeah, UC Davis and Caltrout did a, uh, a study <coughs> at Sanborn Slough and... You know, they, uh, they were catching a ton of fish. And, you know, there's a couple of published papers on that and um, hugely successful. And that's where the fish people are catching up because those wetlands have been doing that for a long time. Yeah. The Butte Sink's been providing salmon habitat for a long time. We don't need to change a lot of things. But the reaction of most government is, is we have to do something. We have to, we, we have to take an action to fix something. And sometimes that action actually has a negative impact. Um, you know, we're talking about flooding the Butte Sink for fish. Well, if you do that, you're checking a box because you took an action, but we're already providing fish habitat. You know, yeah. recognize what exists before you change something um, and may or may not have those additional benefits. Yeah. So, um, and then you get into the politics of the farming community and, you know, rice and, and everyone's looking for their piece and how they can, you know, they can get something out of the current, you know, situation, um, current environment. Um, and I mean, we're doing the same. I mean, we're, we're here to protect ducks and, and duck hunters and, and, uh, nothing's getting easier. Things are getting more complicated and, and challenging for us to maneuver through all these different things to make sure we get water and, and places for, um, for ducks and duck hunters. But does that help us? I mean, we have relationships with the fish people. We have relationships with, ag does that help us kind of being in the middle to to help you know talk between the the groups when we're at we are at a stakeholder meeting well it, it allows us to have some influence on yeah. what's taking place and can drive 
maybe not drive the bus, but you get, you're able to at least identify yeah. how it's going to impact waterfowl and what they need to be thinking about long term if they're going to go down a certain road right. and how that's going to influence waterfowl populations or management of habitat and what that's repercussions might be. Um, you know, in developing projects like throughout these areas where we it is within the floodplain, you know, a lot of stuff that we always have done historically with fish in mind is to make sure that there's no areas that don't drain. We want to make sure when landowners, agency personnel draw water off in the spring for feed production, that all the water goes back out and into the, you know, like Sanborn Slough. You know, we had huge sinkholes in yeah. there that maintained acres and acres of water. Huge. We had lakes out there. We had lakes out there that never dried up. Yeah. Well, you know, part of that main project was to go in and make sure that the last board in the, in the drain riser was the lowest part on the yeah. property. To Corn has got to eat too, dude. Come right. On. Yeah. <laughs> so ensuring that as many of those smoke could get back out after flooding. Right. Uh, occurred so you know that's that's always been a part of our job especially in these you know whether it's the Sutter bypass or the Butte sink or Yolo bypass those were always maybe unintentional benefits to fish but our main goal was to ensure that no water was left behind so you didn't grow extra vegetation <clears throat> that created yeah. issues for management but at the same time it's ensuring that fish were also escaping the, the site to get back into the drainage so they could get back out yeah. Into the ocean. So yeah, that's great. And, you know, and there's a lot of the grant programs request, you know, are you benefiting fish? And those are things that we clue in on, you know, during our writing is like, yeah, we're making it where there's no entrapment issues. You know, we're, we're installing more riparian tree species. That's going to benefit fish as well as waterfowl. But yeah. at the same time, there's always lots of benefits, but at the same time, being at stakeholder at that table, being able to have some influence and let people remember you know, it's not just fish where there's a lot of other species that are dependent upon these wetland habitats that you need to consider yeah. in the process. Yeah, the, the grant writing game is exactly that. It's, you know, it's a, it's a game. You got to, you got to yeah. look at all the different pieces and angles to see how you can direct funds to what we're trying to, to accomplish. Yeah. I mean, these, these funds are competitive. So I oh, mean, absolutely. Oh, yes. what do we do different? Than other organizations, and what's our what's our philosophy on building a wetland that might <coughs> differ from others in terms of how we go about a project and how we see it working for either the landowner or the public refuge manager when we look at a project from start to finish. I mean, one of our I feel biggest opportunities for landowners and agency personnel working with a CWA biologist is the fact that you will typically be working with the same individual yeah. from start to one, finish. One person. Yep. And, and our goal is to provide you a turnkey project. When we're done, we'll just hand you the keys and you can drive. But at the same time, part of our job is also to ensure that you, as the driver of that vehicle, knows how to drive it, right? Yeah. So, and, and driving it is is sometimes I think these things get overcomplicated, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we've got <laughs> water flows downhill, right? And in, it, for most most projects, we're working on a pretty flat landscape. Mm -hmm. um, we don't need to over-engineer it. Um, and that's why in a lot of cases, we've got our biologists are doing the, the planning, the design, the construction supervision start to finish. And I think that's the biggest difference um, you know, between us and, and other groups is that it's a one-stop shop, one individual, you know, we're still subcontracting out all the tractor work and, yeah. you know, the earth moving and um, that's no different than anyone else. Um, but we don't have a, a team of engineers on our staff or, you know, consultants or anything like that. It's keep it simple. You know, um, water cost runs down. Cost water effective. runs downhill. Cost effective. And and, you, and 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 I think, you know, <sighs> we just try to get stuff done and move on to the next next project, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, you know, the, there's games that could be played with trying to make as much money as you can, billable hours, dragging your feet for years on end, designing, permitting, all of those things can really get drug out. But in the end, we want to see water flowing on that wetland, yeah. you know, and, and as quickly as we can. I mean, that's the best part. I don't get out in the field as much as I used to, but, man, when you take a, a field, whatever it was, 
start working with the landowner, design it, yeah. make maps, you know, do all the engineering and the design. Everyone's happy. But then we hire a contractor, we build it. And then when that's done and you turn the water on and you get to see it flow across that dirt and then come back every year and look at the vegetation yeah. and say we screwed something up, right? We didn't plan for two years, three years, and we missed something. Yeah. We go back and we'll fix it, you know, and, and make those small corrections. But watching those things just grow is, you know, it's so rewarding. Oh, it's yeah. such a fulfilling part of the job. And, you know, I, again, going back to the bureaucracies and the, and I couldn't sit in an office and just plan and plan and plan and plan and plan. And that's all I do. I got to see the dirt move. Yeah. yeah. You know, we talk yeah, about all these, part. we're talking about cutting the green tape and, and how we make permitting and all these, you know, bureaucratic processes, you know, more uh, streamlined so that we can actually move the dirt. Well, we've been doing that for a long time. Yeah. And, um, I think we take pride in the fact that we just knock these things out and move on to the next one rather than milking them for lack of better word. Right. Yeah. yeah and, and for private landowners, when we work with them, we, you know, sometimes most of the time, the biologists, when we're working with funding, like right now we're working on 2025 and 26, like 2024, we worked on over the last two years for funding. Yeah. Lining out the funding, everything's going in fiscal years. So whether it's an agency person or a private landowner, when you work with them, you know, there's a timeline. Some private landowners are like, I want to, I want to do something this summer, and it's October, right? You're like, yeah. next summer, okay. So you're probably going to need to fund a whole project yourself, and some landowners want to do that. Yeah. And we have the capability where we'll just do a private contract, and we'll knock the project out. Say they bought 200 acres, and they want to see it in wetlands next fall. We can do that. It's that easy. Okay. Um, at the same time, if they want to wait and try to get funding, hey, 2025, 26, maybe your year, um, and we'll work you into the next grant proposal. And same with the agencies, working with the federal, state, wildlife areas and refuges. Same thing for them. You know, We're working with staff right now in wildlife areas for projects in 2025, 26, and 27. So it takes a while to set up the funding, but as a private landowner, you have the option. If you just want to go to construction, you know, yeah, you we do. had a landowner this year who was in escrow and he had us out to go look at the property and we're like, well, when do you want to start? He's like, the day I close, I want to move dirt. And huh. so, you know, we had like a month of prep time, got it surveyed, got it designed, had the contractors lined out. They signed the paperwork. The next day we started moving dirt. That's great. And he's got his brand new wetlands or, you know, Thule transplants have been done. Water grass has been grown and he'll be flooded up this fall. And it looks like a nice, you know, he's got groceries for the ducks and he, he closed it was like mid June. So. Yeah, on a project like that, he's hiring CWA out to create the wetlands. We're not putting in funds to yeah. help match and all that good yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah, I mean that guy basically his hired us like you would hire anybody to come in exactly do the survey, the design, the engineering, construction management, turnkey it for him. Yeah, um, and that's where too a lot of landowners were. If you hire California Waterfowl to come in and do all your your surveying, design, engineering, we can engineer it the most efficient way possible for moving the dirt. So you don't have to guess. You don't have to hire a contractor and say, here, here's what I want to do. When you work with a CWA biologist, we know exactly what it's going to cost us to build this before yeah. we ever get a contractor within a mile of your property. Because we know how much dirt we're going to move. We know how many, how much, how many feet of pipe we got to put in, what lift pumps need replacing or not. So we're able to calculate out exactly what it's going to cost you prior to getting anybody involved based upon the market price for moving dirt at that in that location. Yeah. And we can sit there and jockey around the dirt loads, figuring out the most efficient way to move the dirt. You know, if we level it this way, it's going to be this much dirt. If we level, level it this way, it's going to be that much dirt. But at the same time, we can also sit there with somebody and give you all the options as to, hey, do you want this to be a 100-acre unit? you want it to be a 50-acre unit? Because based upon the fall in it, it's this much dirt to make it a 50-acre, two 50-acre units, or it's this much dirt to make it a 100-acre unit. Yeah. And then what do you want to see on the ground? And we can calculate all that ahead of time so you can make decisions. Yeah, we ran into that with Sanborn, right? There was right. some areas that if we made it a little bit lower, it was going to cost a, exactly. a lot of money. But um, no, I think it was great when you guys did Butte Creek Island Ranch, you know, you guys are planning for so long. That's how the tractors get there. I mean, it it is moving, and it's like boom, instant wetland. Right. And we're ready to roll, and uh, that transformation is is pretty pretty awesome. Um, so you guys are duck hunters. 
you, you know, you guys create habitat. What is your guys' personal opinion on, you know, closed zone sanctuaries or in some people's words, like these mega clubs and, and where all that stuff sits in in terms of waterfowl and hunting? Um, what do you guys think of that? What would you say to someone like that if they ask you the question? Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's a lot to unpack. The, I mean, sanctuaries are important. You know, any any duck club that doesn't have one, they're at a disadvantage. I would agree. Because, For sure. um, you know, these birds need a place to rest, and they're going to seek refuge wherever they can, and that's part of the management. You have to manage that 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 space and that refuge for these birds to keep them in the area. Yep. I and mean, if everybody goes out and just blazes away, there's too many places for them to go now. Yeah. yeah. Um, that may not have been the case, you know, 40 years ago when we didn't have flooded rice and, um, but there's so many places for these birds to go sit. If you don't have a place for them to sit, they're going to go somewhere else. Exactly. Yeah. So not only do you need to have a sanctuary, but you also have to manage your hunting pressure. Um, you, it, it, folks that go out there and they shoot day in and day out, they're not they're not going to kill as many birds as as a club that that you know hunts less, manages their shoot times, and has a sanctuary. Yeah. And I know it's hard. I mean, you see birds grinding around in a unit, and you're like, I want to. There's nothing over here. I want to go over there. Right? That's the hunter in you. I want to go get a duck. Yeah. But you do that, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, keeping uh, birds in your area is, is extremely huge. important. Yeah. And, and I think and I think you know, private landowners have figured out that equation. Some of them have Some anyway. Them. Yeah. And you know, there, there's, there's the pie's only so big, so it's getting carved up into smaller pieces, and it's getting harder and harder for folks. And you know, some of these mega clubs, I mean, that's capitalism. You got somebody that's got tons and tons of money; they go build a thousand acre refuge. What are you going to do? How are you going to stop them from doing that? But it definitely changes the flyway and oh, yeah. houses birds that would have otherwise been somewhere else. Right. And it's, it's definitely complicated, you know, the system, and 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 I think made it made it tough on on a lot of clubs that used to shoot well and they just don't anymore. And that's... Well, it's a competitive factor too. Like yeah. as a duck club or as a refuge or a, a wildlife area, you got to be competitive. Yeah. You know, it's it's not the 1970s and there's no, you know, where there's no decomp water and if duck wanted to land on a wetland... Yeah, it's not just the butte sink in the valley anymore. Right. right. I mean, the butte sink used to be, that's the place to be. That's the only place where there's wetlands. Yeah, and if you had a you rice blind, it's flooded, you're shooting ducks in the 70s. Exactly. Yeah. That that was that was it. That was Everything it. else was burnt or right. whatnot. And now with decomp, there's well, rice and it, it, it's, it's kind of the, like Southern California. If if a water if a waterfowl migrates through Southern California, it's pretty much like it was in the seventies up here. Like, terms they of water, want water. It's probably a duck club or a state or federal refuge. Yeah, yeah. right. Different. Totally yeah. different compared to once you get into Sacramento Valley or yeah. Central Valley in general. Um, you got to be competitive, and that's you know one thing that we talk to landowners about and the agency personnel is you have to be competitive. You got to give, you know, you got to be able to give them food, you got to give them water, and you got to give them a place to rest. Yeah, you know, if you look at any given property, biology one hundred and one, right? <laughs> as a duck, it hasn't changed. It hasn't no. yeah. Food, We're, <laughs> water, water, cover. I mean, and and if you, exact, and so sanctuaries are just a, one more piece in the puzzle. Or if you have a property and you're able to establish a sanctuary, magically your best shooting blinds are going to be the closest ones to your sanctuary. Yeah. Just like at any refuge or any wildlife area. Right. First blinds that get picked are the ones right next to the refuge. Why is that? Obvious. So yeah. with landowners, you, you, you talk to them and you try to figure, you know, people always talk about, well, the, the wildlife areas or the federal refuge areas should be moving their sanctuaries. But the logistics yeah. of that is it's not realistic. You cannot just move sanctuaries for the pub on public ground for one because they got to re-sign everything. They got to re-establish yeah. blinds. But it, it doesn't. Let's say they did. I think if they the did, birds would just go move where it, the hunters just, are it, not. Exactly. It is. You know? I mean, on some of these new properties, new restorations that we do, it is amazing how quickly you will see a duck fly up to a levee at a sanctuary and spin around. Yeah, they they, they learn so fast. Oh, yeah. so, so any any rotation of sanctuaries, in in my opinion, would be a very temporary benefit, um, short lived. Well, and I've and, I've seen it factually in the fact that a sanctuary, like at our place, if, if sanctuary gets shot, it's pretty much three plus weeks before things start loading back in it. Yeah, you're gonna have a few ducks, but you blaze away on them. It's a good three or four weeks before they're back to the numbers they were. 
Right. I mean, they're not stupid. Yeah, just, I wish I – there were some papers done back in the, the Mississippi Flyway looking at disturbance and hunting pressure and how long it took for birds to come back into the area. And I don't I don't remember. I think it was like 10 days or – it was upwards of two weeks so before – Yeah, they know. Before things settled back in. Because um, we'll, even at, at my place where the last weekend is the weekend they hit the sanctuary. And then the junior hunts the weekend after – and there's significantly fewer birds in the sanctuary for the junior hunts. Yeah. It's still great for them because there's still enough birds, but it's a noticeable difference and it impacts the rest of the hunting. Even the neighbors, when they'll occasionally hit their sanctuary and the blinds that are closest to that sanctuary will they'll be great while the birds are in there. And as soon as they blaze away on it, it's it, it takes a couple of weeks before people start getting birds out of the other blinds that you that are near this that sanctuary until yeah it loads back up and it can take a while right cool. so i think that yeah and the challenge for us jeff and you run our hunt program is is how do we manage quantity versus quality yeah mm-hmm. it's tough you know um we could have people hunting at our property seven days a week there's nothing stopping us from doing that yeah um but i think if we did that the quality of hunting would likely yeah, go down significantly. Right. You have a couple um, good days, storm days maybe, but never it's really. It's like a rice field. You know, you, right. you got to you hunt seven days a week and try to catch the storm days. Um, yeah. So I yeah I mean that's that's the that's the big challenge is how do you where's that sweet spot between quality and quantity? Yeah, I mean in terms of like the glory days, you know, let's talk about the seventies from now. Those duck clubs that were flooded. Is your opinion on these duck clubs now? I mean better habitat now better understanding how wetlands work where previously it was it's duck season flooded up duck oh, season's yeah. over walking i'm out of here walking yeah. away yeah well we <laughs> still see that with with old timers now where that's all they do they flood up and then as soon as duck season's over they pull the boards and move on yeah so they're not looking at growing swamp timothy or water grass or smart weed and not that there's a huge shortage of food but there's that competitiveness. If if you don't have it, they're just going to go somewhere else generally. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, and that's part of when we meet with people, you know, looking at the quality of habitat that they have, you just, you have a a mix of everything currently. You know, if the, it seems like the older the hunters are in the club, as they get younger members to come in, you'll see an interest in doing better management. Sometimes, sometimes the older guys they know exactly how to do good management. They're doing it, and then you get some clubs where nobody's got a clue as to what they're doing. Right? <laughs> it is just flood up, walk away after yeah. the season. So because that's all they had to do back in the seventies. Exactly. The only so water in town. Successful, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And so that's where you're like, you guys have got to be competitive. You know, like, or you'll you'll meet with people and you'll be like, what can we do to make things can improve the habitat? And here's like. Well, you guys have not dissed this place in probably 25 years. You guys you need to disc. Two foot Bermuda grass yeah, all and, over. And, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no. We don't disc here. And I'm like, I know. I see it. Yeah. <laughs> it's all Bermuda and joint grass, spike yeah. grass, whatever. But, um, you yeah. know, that's the active management that we talk to people about, agency personnel, private landowners, whatever it is, is you got to be actively manage your habitat. You yeah. need to be disking 20, 25% of your acres every year. You don't have to disc right next to your blind. But the other 99% of your acreage, you need to be disking annually. Yeah. You know, every three to four years, it needs to get a disc on top of it. Yeah. That way you're keeping that production high. And then you do need to irrigate at least once in most cases. Yeah. If you can irrigate more, go for it if you want. But that's how you're going to maximize your feed production, and that's the groceries we talk about. Yeah. And then you need to maintain that water throughout the waterfowl season until the temperatures are right. When you draw down, you get good germination of the stuff you do want as opposed to drawing down too early and getting the garbage you don't want. Right. So, But we work with everybody. You know, There's a lot of people that call us in the spring, go, hey, when should I be drawing down? We're totally open to anybody calling us, asking us management questions. That's what we're here for. Um, and that's one of the things our you know main goal is make sure if, if we do a project, make sure whoever's going to get handed the keys, they know what to do with it. Yep. That way they can be productive and not waste a bunch of money doing something incorrectly, but take advantage of what they are putting on the ground as far as funds to manage those those properties that they're getting good results from it. And yeah, do you see pride get in the way sometimes where guys are like, you know, I did this with my dad no. and, and this is how we're going to do it. And I don't believe what you're putting down. Stubbornness, man. Duck yeah. hunters are funny people. <laughs> you know, yeah, all got totally. they, they've all, everyone's got their own opinion. And I mean, we see some crazy stuff out there. Um, I think the, uh, 
a duck club manager's always got to do something to, you know, try to make things better, even if it's the wrong thing, you know, planting <laughs> goofy grasses or yeah. whatever. People have, you know, yeah, they do strange things sometimes. You know, but you can, well, you can say, here's the equation. This is what we recommend. Come back a year or two later and, you know, trying to plant this <laughs> or do that. You know, it, it sometimes it's, it's, it's laughable. But. Yeah. Or like guys, well, oh, they plant chufa back in South right. Carolina. Yeah. That's what, we need oh, to plant yeah. chufa out here. It's For like, sure. Okay, okay. You know. Uh, always trying to reinvent the wheel, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But. Well, yeah. I mean, that's the corn thing. Try, try disking <laughs> and irrigating. There's plenty of seed in this yeah, wheel. Yeah, yeah, right. But again, duck, they want to do something, so you got to, let's plant something. Okay, well, you're going to spend money for no reason, generally. Yeah, and I think that's the thing with a lot of folks, um, just how expensive it is to just manage a piece of ground, you know, especially if you have to pay someone <laughs> to manage it for you. You right. have all your irrigation costs, mosquito abatement, diesel, tractors, <laughs> It's a lot of money to go out and shoot a duck. So yeah, you know. and that's the only thing you don't want to do is like look at your expenses yeah. and how many ducks. I don't you know. own a duck club and I don't want to do that. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> no, I mean and the estimates are you know for a property you're probably talking between 150 and 200 dollars an acre just yeah. to manage it for waterfowl. Yeah. So you know you can extrapolate the numbers from there, but I think most people are like you know I'd love to have a duck club when I grew up, and then like now you're in it and you're like. Right. Man, that's a that's some coin that you're not yep. really getting back at well, the end of the year. But you can't look at it for a dollar amount per duck or anything like no, that. No, it's, you it's don't. A want love. It's, a, it's, it's a labor of yeah, love. Yeah, it's yeah. a labor of love. I would love to have a duck club and manage it and do all the things that I said you shouldn't do. I would do the same thing. Yep. I'd plant stuff and I'd <laughs> tinker with it. And of course I would. Every duck club owner has a green thumb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they always want to plant something. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, um, you guys have been in the industry for a long time. If someone is wanting to get a job with you know CWA or any of the other agencies, what's the right avenue? And if I have a different background than both of you and me getting into CWA, but I mean, what's the recommendation? Particular college degrees to look for, um, field work. How important mm -hmm. is that, especially in you know building the wetlands, construction side, heavy equipment, all that? I'd say. Coming out of college, you know, when we're looking for an employee, you know, Barna, somebody who's a hard worker, self-motivated. At the same time, depending upon the position, you know, we have entry-level positions for people without a degree and entry-level positions for a degree. Sometimes we'll combine the two. Um, on, and I can talk from the wetland side of things, you know, we're always looking for, you know, our entry-level positions usually kind of our, our test test plot. You mm -hmm. know, if we hire you, we, we do a lot of surveying as far as topographic surveying, a lot of physical labor, um, collecting data. And so for that position, you know, if you have a degree, typically, you know, we'll bounce back and forth from no degree to somebody with a degree. But at the same time, like what was their previous experience? Have If they're coming out of college with a degree, do they have any field experience? What did they do during their summers? Did they you know, did they volunteer? Did they have a summer position, a seasonal aid position somewhere where they got some experience working, you know, under an agency or a nonprofit and gaining experience? Because there's a lot of times where people come out of college, they got a four-year degree and they have no experience. Like they didn't work on a graduate project for some grad student or nothing, where, you know, they had a great job doing whatever, making a ton of money, but it was like not in the field. So now I'm the guinea pig to hire you, right? Yeah. So any experience people can come to us when they put in for a position in that related field, whether it's seasonal aids, whether they worked, you know, biological position, uh, anything that got them some experience working out in the field is great. Now, do we expect you to come to the wetlands department and know what to do construction-wise? No. When I hire you as a biologist to do project implementation, I know pretty much it's a three-year investment on my side of things before I know you're going to be independent. Three years to build relationships, to learn how to write grants, to learn how to engineer, figure out dirt loads, this and that. It's a three-year investment that CWA is going to put into that position yeah. before we know it's independent. Trial by fire. <laughs> right, which is good, which is like our, se our seasonal aid. When we, we hire them to do topographic surveying and setting grades and checking grades and stuff, I mean, that's the test plot where, like, can they handle the heat of the Central Valley? Yeah. Do they have allergies that put them out of work for a week and a half? You know, do, 
do vehicles get destroyed? I don't know. It's just the yeah. test ground. It's like it's a lot of work. It's long hours. It's miserable conditions. Because you can ask people in an interview all day long, like, how do you like Central Valley? You ever lived here before? Yes. No. Maybe they have. Maybe they have. You know, how do you react when it's 110 degrees out right. and you're surveying? Yeah, so, that's not the glory. glory no, it's work not right glory there. at that Rattlesnakes point. and ditches Everything. and all that good stuff. All kinds of, you, know, you get stuck and you're out and you got to walk a mile and a half back to the truck to get it. And so we we do a lot of testing of individuals to see how people react and how they really love the position because it is it's it's what we do is it's such a specialized field. We really. I mean, it's it's a specialized field in the fact that we love the positions that we have. We yeah. had to all earn them. And you can tell that because of the longevity of our personnel that we have I would agree. doing wetland construction. Yeah. I mean, all of us almost, you know, they don't leave very often once we get them in a permanent position. Yeah. I think that says a lot about CWA as a whole and, and kind of the people that we tend to hire and, and keep around. Um, usually hard workers love waterfowl and work really well together as a as a unit you know so uh, and passion if 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 <laughs> california would let me put on a job application requirement to be a duck hunter i'd add that to it and tell you that yeah yeah you know our best employees that we that we have that we've ever had and still have are you know they're all passionate about duck hunting yeah yeah um, that's i think that's that's key by far the most important thing um we've We've had some experiments that have failed pretty miserably, um, but uh, you know I'm I'm proud of the team that we have. I mean I we've got some some good enough. folks. Yeah, that, uh, and they the job's not always easy. It's not always fun. You know, there's paper pushing. You know, there's projects that we don't want to work on. But you know, being a part of CWA and being a duck hunter, I mean that's that's key. So combine so, combine you guys have been here for. 40 years. I mean, what, what do you guys hope to accomplish by the time, you know, you finally do retire at some point in your careers? That's probably can't retire. I mean, we've got to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, join the board, still <laughs> stick around. No, I, the, the, the greatest thing that I've really enjoyed being able to work for CWA is the ability to be effective. Um, and I, when we hire people for these positions, it's, you're not going to have a supervisor over your shoulder hounding you to do yeah. stuff. I mean, pretty much the proof is in the pudding. If you know, we always tell the guys like you need to at some point your position is dependent upon you being successful at grant writing and getting projects implemented on the ground. Yeah. And it's very obvious if that's not happening, but the ability for me personally to be able to put together projects do great projects on the ground, watch the excitement people have for the results and the effectiveness and the ability to create awesome habitat that waterfowl love and shorebirds love and deer and everything else I like to kind of kill um, is the fact that we're so efficient. <laughs> I mean, we just, we don't mess around. They, by the time we get the majority of our funding, like everything's already been pre-planned, pre-permitted, everything's ready to go. So there's no hindrance for us to be able to knock projects out. Yeah. That's the best part. And your um, window is pretty short to yeah, do I the mean, projects. We, yeah, it just depends on the region of the state. But you look at the Sacramento Valley. I mean, it's June, July, August, and getting into September, people don't want you around. Yeah. Right? You, they want to flood up we'll and get going. Up and so get it's, ducks. you know, you may be able to start sometime early in May. Um, Southern California is totally different. I mean, we can start sometime in February, and but you need to be kind of out of the – that desert environment come mid June because it gets a little hot. Yeah. Um, so you do have these windows of opportunity to get things knocked out. And you don't have a lot of time. So yeah, you got to be effective. You can't be waiting for permits. All that stuff's got to get done way ahead of time. And so you know, it's a cyclical thing that we do. But at the same time, it changes biologically what we're doing in the office. You know, you're going into fall. You're writing reports of how you spent money. You're writing proposals to get more money you're doing permits that need to be ready in hand by march for various areas and then yeah. you're working on designs and then before you know it you know we'll be starting right after the first of january down at colorado river moving dirt just because i think you just want another big spoonie award before you retire yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that works good 
about you, Jake? You've worked your way up, kind of been the steer of the ship within the organization, I would say, making us more professional and kind of where we're at today. Whoa. Where did that um, come from? from? From the days in the Natomas office with packs of dogs roaming around to kind of where we are now. I still have dogs roaming around. There's a couple, but. Um, you know, I, yeah, I don't, uh, I have a hard time envisioning retiring. Um, for a lot of reasons, um, so it's hard to say what I want to do by the by the time I re- retire. Um, I, I hope to work until I'm dead. But the, uh, um, I think you know you, you want to leave something better than you found it. Yeah. And uh, you know I've got two kids. I've got a a ten year old and a thirteen year old, and I'd like to think that you know twenty years from now they still have the opportunities that that I've had, you know, and that, that does get harder and harder to, to see with all the challenges that we face. Um, you know, I'm proud of the hunt program that we created, you know, providing access and providing opportunities and experiences to thousands and thousands of people. Right. Um, that's important to me. Um, the land trust that we created and protecting the land. I think that's hugely important. We, you know, we all see what happens in this state and the land's getting carved up and, and the pressure being put on the existing wetlands and, and hunting areas that we have. And, and land protection is, 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 is important. Um, so I'd like to see more of that. Um, and, and all of that is really to, to ensure that we maintain what we have and in the end, um, we're still able to hunt ducks, uh, pursue our passion, you know, 20 years from now or, or whenever that might be. Um, so I think doing uh, more of the same, you know, I, I, CWA is is really diverse in all the, the things that we do, sometimes to a fault. We have our hands in too many things. Yeah. Um, I envy some of the other groups where they're really focused. But – Having that flexibility, that that nimbleness to adapt and to try different things, and if they don't work, fine, move on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's allowed us to spawn something like the hunt program, um, and I'd like to see those things grow. I'd like to see them continue, and who knows? I don't know what's next, um, but I I like the fact that we've got a strong team and we've got the ability to, um, you know try things and and try to um, find solutions to these big challenges that that we face um, that are ever growing so and it's uh, nice the fact that we have a board that trusts the staff and the leadership of the staff to be able to make recommendations and not just be one-sided or driving a an issue where over the years I mean when I first started at CWA I mean we had it was 45 or 50 board members. It was Ooh. nuts. I remember my first board meeting. It was like, like two, oh my gosh. second day I was here, and it was like, it was massive. And the ability for them to listen to what Jake or any of the staff has as far as ideas, and when you pitch them an idea, they take the time to, to mull it over, and they trust us enough where they allow us to take these avenues. You know, yeah. 20-something years ago, we'd gone to them wanting to buy Sanborn Slough. I mean, that wouldn't even have been a question we would have asked. You know what I mean? But they trust us enough where when opportunities arise, they're very supportive in, in, in what they allow us to do and what they decide. And that's been a huge thing over the years is their ability, you know, to trust staff and listen to what we have and see if we can develop things when we see the opportunities. You know, a huge organization, we wouldn't have the flexibility to be able to move quickly on certain certain opportunities that arise. Yeah. That's one good thing about CWA is the fact that, you know, we are just within California. Um, we have the capabilities to move quickly on opportunities, and we have such a cohesive group that, you know, we have a lot of trust between the board and between the staff. It makes us really effective in what we can do. Yeah, I think we're small but, but mighty. Yeah, um, I would agree. You know, we've got about 50 staff, and – the opportunity to to increase staff and do more has been there, you know, especially in the last few years with all the funding that's out there, yeah. with state and federal, you know. But then I, you know, my fear in that is that those resources ebb and flow, and 
Um, you know, somebody once told me, stay, keep CWA small. You know, don't become the big bureaucratic corporation. Don't become the big bureaucratic agency yeah. that we complain about a lot of times, you know. Um, stay small, stay effective, just get stuff done. And, you know, our staff takes pride in that. Um, we like being cost effective. We like getting things done. And, you know, it's, it's something that we're proud of. It's hard. It's really hard sometimes, um, but but yeah, we're proud of that. I am for sure. No, same here. Um, but yeah, to your point, you know, program wise, it's really nice to pivot to something that if it d one thing doesn't work without having to go all through the processes and and whatnot, and just literally that didn't work, switch programming, head another direction, and do it quickly. So. Hey, life's life's a big experiment. You just got to try stuff and. Take one step at a time and see where it goes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, cool. Well, thank you guys for joining me and uh, appreciate you having, me on, having you on. Yeah, yeah thanks for fun. the opportunity. Sweet. Thank you for tuning in this episode at Save for the Blind podcast. You can listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere podcasts are found.